Good morning. Um, my name is Douglas Griffin. This is the 3rd of July, uh, 2022. My, um, this is my Sunday school class. So my mom will not be singing in case some of you are looking to see, oh, I wonder if they have another video or, or with my mom. Uh, we, we're in the book of Exodus and I teach a Bible study every week on Sundays. Also on Wednesdays, we're in the book of John on Wednesdays. Right now, we are in the sixth chapter of Exodus. I go verse by verse through the Bible. I feel like it's easier to understand and take things in context when you go that way. Um, so that's just my way of doing it. Um, right now, Moses um, <laughs> is in an interesting situation. God, as you know, appears to him in the burning bush and says, I'm sending you down to rescue my people. He mentions a twofold purpose. Um, well, he says, go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go to for a three days journey into the wilderness. So first of all, God offers him something quite reasonable that he's done for other groups. Three days journey in the wilderness. Pharaoh's going to say no. And then I'm going to bring judgments on him. It's going to accomplish two things. It's going to force him ultimately to let you go, even though that's not his will. Uh, I'm not changing his will. I'm just changing the circumstances around him so he's going to be forced to let you go. But also, it's going to increase my people's desire to leave because even though the Hollywood movie tells us differently, um, the Jews at that time chose to live there because in Canaan, they didn't really have any land. Uh, Abraham had bought a, the cave of Machpelah, right? Um, and Isaac, Jacob had some land, um, a little bit of land in, in the north. Um, and that's all. There wasn't anything that they owned that was large enough to sustain this huge group of people. And so in Egypt, they had land. And, and although they were slaves there and, and they were burdened, they lived in the best land in Egypt. Um, uh, Joseph had secured that for them. And they, they, were, they ate and once the work was done, they were through. Um, and they had chosen actually to stay there because it was difficult for them to believe the promises that God was going to somehow give Canaan to them. So God, as much as they thought, and people will say one thing and then do another, um, much as they thought, boy, we really want to leave. As you, as you know, once they did leave, they kept trying to go back because they really didn't want to leave. Uh, it was easier. It's easier sometimes to, what's that phrase, stay with the devil you know than the devil that you don't know. It was, they knew how Egypt worked. They'd been there for a couple hundred years. They knew how it worked. They had that system down. But it was frightening to go to the promised land uh, because who knew what was there waiting for them? If they were giants or they had no idea. And so God had to increase the pressure on them also so that, so that it would be so bad that they would want to leave and risk going to Canaan and not keep trying to go back, which, which they did. Okay, so Moses goes to Pharaoh, says, let my people go, and Pharaoh increases the labor of the Egyptian, uh, of the Israelites in Egypt. <sighs> so now most, God gives Moses a command, I want you to go back to Pharaoh, and Moses is arguing with God. And the, the last part of this chapter is kind of about the consequences of arguing with God. Um, so God gives Moses several promises, seven promises. Four of them are used during the Passover, and then there's three more promises. Um, some rabbis say, because, and there's a glass of wine with each promise, uh, during the during the Passover, and some rabbis say we didn't do all seven promises because you don't want anybody to have seven glasses of wine, and then they have to drive home from Passover. Uh, but also, the last three promises are things that were, were to happen once they cross over into Canaan, 
And the first four promises are the ones that get them out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. And so that's, so as far as Passover and the angel of death passing over them, that's the part they want to celebrate. Um, so God says, here are seven promises. You go tell the children of Israel the seven things I'm going to do for them. And that they can now call me Jehovah, which is the promise-keeping God, as opposed to Elohim, which is the almighty God. But they've never seen me as a God who keeps promises yet, because I made this promise to Abraham 400 years ago. And you haven't seen me keep it, but now you get to learn me as the God who keeps his promises. Uh, but they weren't buying it. Uh, in, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 9, it says, So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, told them everything, but they did not heed Moses because of the anguish of spirit and the cruel bondage. It's like, because Pharaoh had made things worse. It's like, eh, we don't believe you. We believed you last week when you came and you showed us all those miracles, but now we don't believe you anymore. So here's God saying, I'm gonna do all this for you. And the people are saying, nah, sorry. Okay, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, go in and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of his land. So this is your second time. Moses is arguing with God. Moses spoke before the Lord saying, the children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? So I couldn't get them to listen, and they're my people. How am I going to get Pharaoh to listen? As though God doesn't know what he's talking about. And this, we argue with God sometimes. As though, like, why are you telling me to give in this offering and you know i got to pay rent? Like God went, oh, man, I didn't even think about that. Uh, God knows everything. But, but we argue with God, I'm not going to go up and talk to that person. You know, they could be crazy. I mean, we argue with God. Uh, so, so Moses is arguing, and the rest of the chapter is about that. Um, he says, uh, and Moses spoke to the Lord, said, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am uncircumcised lips. And he's saying, it's like I have a covering over my mouth. I'm not good with words. I haven't been circumcised. The foreskin has not been removed from my mouth. I still fumble. So I'm not good with words. Again, God said, just do what I ask you to do, and I'll give you the words. And that's what he tells us to do. See that person over there? Just go up to them. I will give you the words. That person I put on your heart, just call them. I'll give you the words. I'm just asking you to be obedient. Open your mouth. I will give you the words. But we're like, well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Because we don't trust that God will give us the words, okay? So then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because they're both there, and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So before he says, I want you to go, but now it's like, now you have no choice. I'm having to command you. You argue with me, so I'm telling you, you must do it. Gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now, the story stops there, and suddenly there's a genealogy. But really, the story does not stop. And, and I want to give us an example. Uh, let's say you're bringing a friend over to meet your crazy aunt. And you're about to walk in the door, and you realize she's got cat food all over the house. No cats. Hey. Just cat food all over the house. Hey. And so you think, I better give a background to explain what happened to this woman when she was young and she had a cat, but then it disappeared, but she hasn't dealt with it and blah, blah, blah. And you, you give the background so that she, the person that you're bringing over will be prepared for what they're about to see. This is the background. They're giving this genealogy because this was written after the children of Israel had already come out. This is not written as they're going. They're reading this in the wilderness, basically. Uh, and what they're about to tell you, they've already witnessed um, uh, the, 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 the results they've already witnessed. And so they're saying, look how, see how Moses is arguing with God? Isn't this amazing? Because Moses went through the same situations with people arguing with him. They saw people challenged Moses all the time. And at the end of this chapter, they said, this is that same Moses, that same Moses who you know is all upset because people are always challenging him. That same Moses who's like, I can't believe you're coming against me. I can't believe you're arguing with me. God said this. And yet this is that same Moses who's now argue, who's arguing with God. 
So he says, let me give you this genealogy because I, I need to, because you may not even believe this is that same Moses. This couldn't be Moses that we know. He knows better than to argue with God, does he? Let, let's give you some background. So it just suddenly stops and gets you a genealogy. And and because he's listing, here are all the people that have come at God recently in Moses' own family tree. And so you'd be shocked to think that Moses also was doing this. So he starts with the oldest brother. So there's 12, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob had 12 sons. Reuben is the oldest, then Simeon, then Levi. Levi is the direct descendant of Moses. So um, he says, let me start and with these people and give you some examples of people who've been arguing with God. Because I know you can't believe that Moses is sitting there arguing with God, but yes, he is. And this is, pop, this is basically a family trait. Uh, so he says, these are the heads of their father's houses. The sons of Reuben, he starts with Reuben, the firstborn of Israel were Hanuk, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. So he says, listen, four sons of Reuben. And he says, I've got a story about Palu. Now, Reuben, the oldest, he had four sons. Let's remind ourselves of what Palu did. Um, uh, in Numbers chapters 26, now again, they're already in the wilderness when Exodus is being written, right? Exodus has already happened. But they're reading it now, and these things have happened in front of them. Uh, Numbers chapter 26, verse 8 through 9, it says, And the son of Palu was Eliab. So Reuben's son was Palu, one of his four sons. He had a son, Eliab. Here's what he did. The sons of Eliab were Nemuel, Dathan, and Abiram. These are the Dathan and Abiram representatives of the congregation who contended against Moses and Aaron. So this Moses who's, who's arguing with God, he had the same experience with Reuben's great grandkids who were arguing with him. Remember Dathan and Biram? They contended against Moses and Aaron in the company of Korah. Now we'll get to who Korah is. When they contended against the Lord. Why? Because God had chosen Moses' line and Moses and Aaron's line to be over everybody. And they didn't like that. In, Moses, in, in Numbers chapter 16, verse 12, it says, Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come up. So they had, um, uh, they, they had sent word to Moses saying, we're not listening to you. We don't believe God's really talking to you. Who do you think you are? And... Um, so Moses sends for them because he wants to work it out. And, and they says, we will not come up. No, we, we don't want to talk to you. We've sent you word that we don't have to listen to you. We don't care who you say you are. God didn't put you in that place. You put yourself in that place. Right? These are Reuben's kids. Reuben's great grandkids, great, great grandkids. <clears throat> he says, is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? So excuse me, they're saying we were in a land flowing with milk and honey. You brought us out of Egypt to kill us in the wilderness. And I'm emphasizing <clears throat> their um, attitude because they look back at Egypt fondly. This is why God had to increase the bondage. He knew when, he, when Moses went to Pharaoh that Pharaoh would say, no, I'm going to make things worse. God knew that. He's going to accomplish two things. I'm going to be able to, to bring judgment on, um, oh, thank you. I'm going to be able to bring judgment on Pharaoh, which I want to do, because I want everybody to see, here's what happens when you come against God. Egypt is the most famous kingdom in the world right now, and Pharaoh's going to challenge me, and everyone in the known world this region in the Middle East is going to see what happens to Pharaoh when he challenges me. And that'll be a good lesson for everybody. Also, when he increases the bondage on the Israelites, it'll be enough to make them get out of Egypt. But surely when they get out, they'll look back and go, but we had it so great there. He says, you have brought us out of a land flung with milk and honey. 
just to kill us in the wilderness. So that's how that's what they thought about Egypt. And people will write a new written narrative in their head about something. You leave a job and then later say, I love that job. That was great. And you go, really? Because you complained the whole time. Oh, I, so, that car was so great. Was it? Because it was always breaking down. So you people rewrite narratives in their head. So um, Dathan and, Ir, and, and Abiram, like, no, you brought us out of Egypt. It was the lamb's own milk, milk and lake just to kill us in the wilderness. That, and you should keep acting like a prince over us? Like, who, who do you think you are? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor giving us inheritance of fields and vineyards. We will put, will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. So we can see what, now it's their fault. Moses took them to the, the place where they were supposed to cross over and they refused to cross over. So it's their fault that they're not yet in the promised land, but they're blaming Moses for it, even though it's their fault. So um, the writer of Exodus says, remember Reuben and his family? They challenge Moses. So isn't it amazing that Moses is challenging God? This is that same Moses. Uh, and there's a reason for it, but he's he's bringing them up. Then he goes and says the sons of Simeon. So again, Moses is the, the Levi was the third brother, right? So Reuben's the oldest, Simeon's the second oldest. So he says, let me list Simeon's sons. And the sons of Simeon were Jemuel and Jamin and Ochab and Shachin and Jochar and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. Well, everybody who knows that story, again, at the time they're reading the book of Exodus, they've already crossed out of Egypt. They've been wandering around in the, in the wilderness for years. They already know what happened with Simeon's kids. So uh, uh, in Numbers chapter 25, verse 6, it says, And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brother a Midianite woman, in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So they're at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They're at the, the, the sanctuary, which was, was a tent at the time. They're crying because God is, is saying, I'm disappointed in you because you haven't believed me. You, you're going after other gods. And this person who they will later identify as a descendant of Simeon, he brings a Midianite woman, the very people who are worshiping other idols. He brings a Midianite woman, and it turns out she is the daughter of one of these princes of Midian who, who's trying to seduce the children of Israel into worshiping other gods, into not worshiping the God of the universe. He brings her to the door of the temple right in front of Moses. He's challenging Moses. You're saying that God said this and God said this. I'm bringing this woman right here. He says... And and uh, and then someone who we'll identify in a minute comes in and kills him, right? Because he's dis he's desecrating the temple, right? He's bringing basically a prostitute right to the temple to to have his way with her in front of everybody, just to say just just really to spit in Moses' face. So this is the second person. It was the descendant of Reuben who's challenging Moses, a descendant of Simeon who's challenging Moses, and it says verse. 34. Now, the name of the Israelite who was killed, because someone walked up with a spear and killed this guy because he's desecrating the temple, who was killed with the Midianite moment was Zimri, the son of Salu, a leader of the father's house among the Simeonites. So in this genealogy, he's saying, remember the Reubenites and how their descendants challenged Moses and the Simeonites and how his descendants challenged Moses? Isn't it ironic that Moses was challenging God? And now look what's happening to him. Now, God invented the law of sowing and reaping. He invented that law. What goes around comes around. God invented that. He makes the universe work that way on purpose. If you plant rose seeds, you're going to get roses. If you, whatever you, you reap what you sow. Whatever you plant, that's what you're going to get back. Whatever you put out, that's what comes back to you. So if you're putting out love, 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 people will love you back. Putting out anger, 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 people will be angry, angry back. Whatever you put out. And so Moses is challenging God. Moses, you don't know what you're talking. I mean, God, you don't know what you're talking about. I've already done. And he's challenged constantly, which is why the person kind of put this in there. See how Moses is challenging God? Well, look what happened to him later. Okay. Exodus chapter 6, verse 16. 
So we've looked at Reuben, we've looked at Simeon, and now he's going to go to Levi, who's Moses' own uh, ancestor. So he says, these are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations. Levi has three sons, and these we're going to kind of focus on these, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And the Kohath is the, today we would say Cohen, the Cohen family, and you've all you may have Jewish friends and are the Cohens, right? Uh, there were three families, and that's and Moses is from that middle family, the Cohens, the Kohaths at the time. Um, and the years of the life of the Levi were 137. And the only people who he tells the how long they live were Moses's uh, ancestors. He said, so he starts with the oldest son because there's three sons of Levi, uh, Gershon. Kohath Merari. So he says the sons of Gershon were Libni and Shimni, Shimi, according to their families. Then the sons of Kohath, he's now he's going to come back to them, but he wants it since he's second, he's got to tell you, were Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. Okay, now he's going to go to the third son of Levi, and the years of his life of Kohath were 133. And the sons of Merari were Mali and Mushi. Okay, so I've, I've, Laid it all out. That's what the writer is saying. Now I'm going to let me go back to Amram because that is Moses' descendant. So Levi had three sons uh, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Kohath had Amram. Levi, Kohath, Amram. Amram took for himself Jochebed, his father's sister, as a wife. Now later, this was outlawed. Uh, but at the time, they'd been in Egypt and they'd learned Egyptian ways. Interestingly, God recognizes our backgrounds and says, okay, I'm going to put up with that because you don't know any better. That's not, that's not, you're not defying me. You were raised in that kind of background, so I'm not going to judge you for that. But once I tell you the truth, then I'm going to judge you. God always judges us based on what we know. So the more you learn, the danger of learning the Bible is now you're responsible for it. The more you know, God says, well, now you know. And so you have no excuse. But before, I, I wasn't in love with what you were doing, but you didn't know any better. But now you know better, and so I'm going to hold you responsible. So uh, Amram married his aunt and uh, his father's sister's wife, and she bore Aaron and Moses. So now we, there we are. Levi, Kohath, Amram, and we've got Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 137 years. So he's, he's just kind of giving everybody's ages. Now for a second, he wants to skip over to Ishar. Uh, Ishar was Amram's brother. So this is, this is Moses' uncle. And he just wants to talk about him several. He says, the sons of Ishar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. So Moses' uncle, Ishar, had a son named Korah. This is Moses' cousin. Korah challenged Moses more than anybody. Isn't it interesting that sometimes you have family members that will, cha that will challenge you more than anybody? Uh, so Co Moses' cousin is Korah. His daddy, his, his grandfather, his great-grandfather is Levi, just like Moses's, And so he feels slighted. When the assignments are given for the Levites, the Levite family was chosen for a couple reasons to be priests unto the Lord. When the assignments are given out, Korah's thinking, Moses and Aaron, they got better assignments than everybody else. I got an assignment. I'm not saying I didn't, but why did they get a better one? Because my great grandfather was Levi too. And so, uh, so he complains. So, in Numbers chapter 16, verse 1 through 7, it says, Now Korah, and we know the story, the son of Ishar, this is Moses' uncle, the son of Kohath, the Cohens, right? The son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram. Now, remember, Dathan and, and Abiram, they come from Reuben. Uh, the son of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, they took men. So he's, we're naming everybody who was there. Moses has brought them out of Egypt. Moses was responsible. God used him to part the Red Sea. 
brought down the Ten Commandments. All this stuff is happening, and yet they're still going to challenge Moses because sometimes people do not care how God has used you. They still want their recognition. So they took men and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel. In fact, it was 250 leaders of the congregation. And that's a significant number. It wasn't everybody, just 250, which is a lot of people, but it wasn't thousands. 250 men, representatives of the congregations, men of renown. These are the leaders. They, they had a meeting and decided, we're going after Moses. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves. For all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why do you then exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Now, again, they are Levites. They had assignments. They, 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 they weren't neglected, but they were upset that Moses got to be the leader. Like, why do you get to be the leader? We're all holy. Who, who chose you? <sighs> So verse four says, so when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he spoke to Korah and all his company saying, okay, tomorrow morning, the Lord will show you who he is, who is his and who is holy. So you want to know who, you know, who, who made you ruler? Well, I think it was God, but you know what? Tomorrow he'll show you. <laughs> he said like, God can show you a lot better than I, I can tell you. So uh, he's going to show you who is holy and who is his and will cause him to come near to him. The person that is his, he'll make him come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will also cause to come near to him. Do this. Take a censer, which is like a tray with, that, that was unchanged. Take a censer, Korah, and all your company. Put fire in this tray and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. This was symbolic of prayer going up to God, the fire, the um, because God was teaching them that because they had a they had zero connection to God. We talk about God all the time. We're praying all the time. We we send thoughts and prayers all the time. This was not a concept they had learned in Egypt. What they had learned in their couple hundred years in Egypt is that the gods just do what they want and you're just stuck with it. But God's trying to teach them, no, your prayers go up and I. I hear your prayers. I can see your prayers as they come up to me. So whenever they would pray, he would have them light this center and the smoke would go up so they can imagine, so they could reteach themselves. This is going up to God. So bring the censer and, uh, and, and put fire in it, put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is a holy one. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. So we'll, we'll see. God will choose right then. And they said, cool. So we know what happened, uh, that God came down the next day and judged them and burned up those 250 men. Um, now, here's an interesting part that we sometimes don't uh, talk about. The aftermath. Uh-oh. Uh, okay. Um, the aftermath, okay, it says the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. So the censers, remember oh, Mary, uh, Moses has said, take these censers and put coal in them. When God burned them up, the censers just fell to the ground. So there's all these charred, burnt bodies, and there's all these trays with these coals in them scattered among all 250 burnt bodies. So he says, I want you to take the censers out of the blaze, for the censers are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. The censers of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar. So the censers are holy, and, and the re one reason I'm bringing up this aftermath thing is because um, sometimes you want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Sometimes, like, a, a charlatan will come along who's praying for the sick, and he just wants your money. Give to my ministry, give to my ministry, and I'm praying for the sick, and we find out that he's a charlatan. It's not real. We throw the whole thing out. Then we say, see that whole praying for the sick thing? That's, that's a lie. You know, all that whole miracles for today, that's... We toss the whole thing out. 
Actually praying for the sick is valid. God doing miracles right in your midst, that's valid. Just because that person was a charlatan doesn't mean that what they were doing was not holy. It just means they shouldn't have been doing it. That's not their calling. So these, 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 tra these sensors, he says, that's holy. Take those sensors out. That was, that was, they are holy. That, those people shouldn't have been in that position. They shouldn't have been carrying those sensors, but the sensor, what they were doing was still holy. Uh, the sensors of these men who sins against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar because they presented them before the Lord. Therefore, they are holy and they should be assigned to the children of Israel. So they, they did what I asked and they were the wrong people. But what they were doing was holy. So we don't want to throw everything out once we find out that somebody's a fake. You know, doesn't mean the Bible is not holy. Doesn't mean that prayer cloths, that sometimes you can't pray for somebody and lay your hands in a prayer cloth and, and maybe the anointing is still there. Uh, that, just because someone is, is commercializing it now, you know, send in $15 and I'll send you this prayer cloth from the Middle East that was touched by, you know, whoever. Sometimes we think, ah, oh, that's a lot of hooey. It doesn't mean that it's not still possible for God to use that. It means that that person, God, God is judging that person, but not necessarily the practice of what they were doing. In Numbers, uh, and then there's a section about intercession. Um, it says, in Numbers chapter 16, same chapter, verse 41, it says, on the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. So this is amazing. They challenged Moses. Who told you? And God said, well, let's find, Moses said, let's find out tomorrow. We'll find out who told me. We'll all come before the Lord. We'll all present these censors before the Lord. And then God will judge, you know, let the Lord judge between you and me when we're absent. Uh, God will judge and so God judged. Moses didn't do it. Fire came down from the sky, but they, look what you did, Moses. Okay, so this is pretty, I wouldn't be challenging Moses. Now, the person who's writing this genealogy is bringing all this up because he's saying it's ironic that God is, that Moses is challenging God early on because look how much he was challenged later. Okay, but again, you read what you sow. So um, they're challenging Moses. And so, uh, it says, now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses, this is verse 42 of number 16, when they had gathered against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting. So they're challenging him. God shows up again. Hey, remember me? So, and the Lord spoke to Moses say, get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a, in a, in a moment. So I'm, I'm about to let loose. Uh, and they and Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. Now you can see judgment coming some t towards somebody. We should still intercede for them and try, you know. They've done something to cause judgment to come toward them, but God still wants us to intercede on their behalf, right? So uh, that's like if somebody jumps off a 10-story building okay, judgment is coming toward them fast. You can still try to intercede and catch them. And, you know, they brought something on themselves, but that doesn't mean you go, oh, well, look what they're doing. So Moses and, and Aaron can still try to intercede, which they do. So Moses and Aaron, so Moses said to Aaron, take a censer and put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them, for wrath has gone out from the Lord. So judgment is coming toward them and people are starting to get ill and the judgment, but there's a point where we can stop it. The plague has begun, he says. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. Again, it's a type of prayer. These centers with these smoke going up is a, is a type of prayer. When we look at it today, we go, oh, see, my prayers are going up to God. I should still be praying, even though those people have put themselves in that kind of situation. I still want to pray that judgment, that wrath be slowed down or hopefully stopped. So he put the incense and he made atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living. And so the plague was stopped. And that is our mission sometimes, to stand between the dead and the living. 
you, you know, and and to to be that voice who who's saying, Lord, you know, yes, they've sinned, but I'm I'm standing between the, the living and the dead. I'm standing here, standing in the gap. That's what Jesus did for us. He stood in the gap. We deserved wrath, right? We deserve because all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. We deserve God's wrath. But Jesus then stood in the gap and said, you know, I'm going to stand and I'll take this punishment for them. I'll stand between the living and the dead. So that's what Moses did in this situation, even though they were challenging him. So even when that's why you pray for those who spitefully use you, even when somebody's attacking you, you still pray for them. Even when somebody's coming after you, you still pray, Lord, I'm praying that judgment does not come on them. Um, so now. Back to uh, uh, the three sons of of Kohath, there's uh, of Amram, um, of Kohath. There were Amram, Ishar, Hezbron, and Uziel. So in verse chapter 22, I mean verse 22 of uh, Exodus chapter six, he says, "And the sons of Uziel were Mishael, Elizapam, and and Zithri." So he's just one. He's just going back and saying, "I want to get everybody in there." But you know these stories of these people who challenged Moses and Aaron. Uh, again, isn't it ironic how they're arguing with God, and yet this is they were constantly challenged. Um, so, going back to the main story, he wants to get. He says Aaron took to himself Elisheba. Now he does not give Moses's kids. He he will tell you about Aaron's kids, and again Aaron came from Amram. Um, and Jochebed and Moses and Aaron came from them because Moses's kids, they went off the deep end. Ironically, uh, his grandkid led like uh, this whole pagan rebe rebellion against God. So we don't talk about Moses's kids, but I'll tell you what happened with Aaron's kids because they did good for the most part. So he says, Aaron took to himself Elisheba, who's the daughter of Aminadab, sister of Nashon as wife. So Aminadab is from the tribe of Judah, who's the fourth oldest son. Aminadab had a couple kids. He had Elisheba. He had Nashon. From Nashon comes the line of David and the line of Jesus, right? His sister marries Aaron, and all these priests come from that line, but they intersect kind of at Aminadab, where from him, uh, his daughter gave birth to the whole Levites, uh, that line, and his son... Uh, from him came Jesus. Um, and, and so the, he, he's just saying this is all kind of interconnected there. So Aaron took Elisheba, who's daughter of Aminadab. Again, he's from Judah, who has two kids. Uh, one is Nashon, from who Jesus comes. And she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. So let's talk about Nadab and Abihu. Um, so Aaron has four sons, Nahab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. Nahab and Abihu went crazy. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 through 8, it says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and put incense on it and offered strange fire or profane fire before the Lord. So God did not tell them to do this. So you got variations on the theme where I'm challenging your place. Uh, you're you're up ministering and I want to be ministering and I'm stepping out of my lane into your lane and God saying nope don't do that just do what I told you to do and in this case I am now creating a fake anointing I'm not trying to be in your place I'm pretending that look what God did look at the fire that God because in the in the previous chapter God had sent fire down and had it lit this these, these coals and so Nadab and Abihu, like, we want that same kind of anointing. We want, we want that. Um, uh, so we'll create our own and we'll pretend like, look what God did. So they took incense and they put fire in it and, and walked out like, God lit our coals on fire too. Isn't this incredible? So they offered profane fire before the Lord, which is like fire that God, that wasn't God. And people will pretend anointing. People will minister and pretend yes the spirit of god is on me and he's not okay there's judgment for that uh so it says they offered profane fire before the lord which he had not commanded them 
So, oh, you want fire? It says, so fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. So apparently you want fire. Okay, so I'll send you fire. You're pretending like I sent that other fire, but I didn't. But I'm gonna, here's the real fire since you want it so badly, except I'm going to burn you up. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, remember when the Lord said this? By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So if you're going to come in my presence, I must be regarded as holy, not something that you can use for your own profit. So everybody who's just using God for their own profit, everybody who who stands before the people and, it, and is using it for their own gain, as opposed to doing it because God commanded them to do it, God eventually judges them. God sees. We don't have to worry. God is not on vacation. He's not watching Lucy. He's watching everything. We don't have to worry. He will expose them. They will be judged. Because to those who come near me, I must regard as holy, not regarded as something to be used for profit. So Moses tells Aaron, I know you're upset what happened to your kids, but they didn't regard God as holy. They thought, oh, look, I can use all of this and it'll bring attention to me. Okay, you can do that. But God is watching. So Aaron held his peace because he was going to complain. Then Moses called Mishael and Elizapan, the son of Uziel, and we mentioned him earlier. So these are his cousins, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, so Uziel is their, is their uncle, right? And he, so he gets calls his other cousins and says to them, come near, carry your brethren from below the sanctuary out of the camp. So you carry uh, Nadab and Abihu out. God has just judged them, burnt them up. You carry them out of the camp because their bodies are just sitting there. So they went near and carried them by their tunics. So they didn't touch their dead bodies because God says, do not touch dead bodies. You don't know where they've been and what they've died of. So just in general, don't touch any dead body because whatever disease they had, they may have killed them, may get on you. And you don't understand diseases yet. We haven't in invented microscopes and all that stuff. So you don't understand germs, that whole concept. So just don't touch dead bodies. So they carried them by their tunics, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithmar, his sons, do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes. So here's here's what they were about to do. Uh, normally when somebody dies, they you you take off your head covering and you, your, you don't comb your hair and you tear your clothes because you're saying, my heart is just pouring out in anguish and you, you tear right here where your heart is, right? And that's it, symbolic of, look how my heart is breaking. My heart is torn apart. It says, don't do that in this case. Lest you die and wrath come upon all the people. Why? Why can't they show that kind of... Because in this case, it'll be as though they disagree with the judgment. These people came at God and tried to use God and God judged them. And if you cry, you go, oh my God, I can't believe this then that'll be a signal to the people that you disagree with what God did. And wrath will come upon you. So you're not, you can't mourn like that. There are certain situations where we can't cry as though some wrong has done. We have to say, yes, that I see why that happened. And that's what happens in these situations when you do that. We don't make fun of it. We don't glorify it. But we don't weep as though some wrong thing was done. <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe that happened. <laughs> yes, that happened because, you know, this person was told several times, stop getting drunk and getting to your car, or blah, 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 you know. And, and, and so we're not glad, but, but people in certain position cannot act as though some wrong thing happened. If you tear your clothes and do all this stuff, It'll be like you're challenging God, like, no, what a miscarriage of justice. Uh, and that's not in this case. And, and sometimes things feel like that. Like, oh, my God, she was so young. And I get that. Weep and wail because that is a tragedy. But in this case, this is that everybody has to learn God is real. And you don't play with the things of God. OK, so he said, but let your brethren and the whole house of Israel be well, the burning which the Lord has kindled. Everybody else can weep. But you in that position, if you do it, it'll, it'll send the wrong signal. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. So I've given you an assignment. Please do not um, forsake your assignment. 
Don't come out from the door. Finish your mission because the anointing, I, I, there's, a, there's something I've given you to do. And if you leave your position to go bury these dead, you'll be forsaking my assignment. I've got somebody who can bury those dead. You finished the assignment that I gave you. And they did according to the word of Moses. When else has this happened? Um, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 through 21, it says, um, oh, well, and I, I'll just explain. I, I won't read the whole thing. Um, it says that Elijah threw his mantle on Elisha. And Elisha, instead of following after him and said, because and, and, he's saying, now I'm anointing you. I'm, I'm, I, now's the time to begin your ministry. Can I go back and kiss my father and mother? Can I go who are way away? And he says, hey, fine, do that if you want, but I'm leaving. So instead of doing that, he just, he killed the, the ox that he was, uh, that was treading and, and fed the people that he was with and then left. He didn't take this journey to go find his father and his mother. He went on because the anointing is there now says that will be taken. You have to have an attitude of, I need to do what God is telling me to do. That's more important than these other things. Um, in Matthew 8, verse 19 through 22, uh, it says, a certain scribe came and said to Jesus, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, well, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So you're saying you're going to follow me where I go, but I don't have a specific place to go. Are you willing just to follow me anywhere? And then another disciple said to him, Lord, well, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. You, if you, if you keep making decisions that these earthly obligations are more important than the thing I've called you to do right now, you're going to miss out on it. I, I've given you an assignment and you... It's not like you can never acknowledge those other things, but you have to decide what's most important. God is telling me to do this right now. So even though that seems as important, I want to be those who put God first. If God's telling me to do something, there's a reason for it and I need to do it. And this is a whole lesson that God is trying to get to Moses at this point. Moses is saying, Lord, I don't want to go back to the children of Israel and tell them all these things. I don't want to go to Pharaoh because he's going to say no, he's going to make things worse. And God is saying to Moses, you're, you're concerned about your image. You're concerned about what people are going to think of you. And I need to be more concerned about what I'm asking you to do. What I'm asking you to do is more important than that. And those things will be resolved. But if you put what people think about you, if above what I'm what you know I'm asking you to do then you can't serve me because people are always going to have an opinion people are always going to challenge you Moses and say well who do you think you are and, and why did you and you don't have any right people are always going to do that so you have to decide what's most important because Moses people are always going to challenge you they're always going to disagree because I'm giving you the assignment I'm not giving it to them so so they're going to say well I don't know why you're doing that and if you are going to be more concerned about them and their reaction than what I've told you to do, then you won't be able to serve me because there will not come a time in your life where people will not want to challenge what I've told you to do. So back to uh, Exodus chapter 6, verse 24 says, And the sons of Korah, Asir, and Elkanah, and Abiasaph, and these are the families of the Korahites. So this is all the chorus on purpose. It says, these are the people that challenged Moses. Uh, verse 25 says, And Eleazar, Aaron's son, took for himself one of the daughters of Putiel as his wife, and she bore him Phineas. And these are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites, according to their families. And so um, Aaron's grandson is Phineas, and we know the story of Phineas, Phineas is the one that when the guy brought the woman to the temple, the son of Simeon, uh, the, the ancestor of Simeon, and was going to have sex with this prostitute right in front of everybody to challenge Moses, Phineas is the one that killed him because 
like you can't do that and 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 profane God. You can't. He he administered judgment right there, right there. He says in verse seven of Numbers chapter twenty-five. Now, when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent, and he thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel, and those who died in the plague were twenty-four thousand. So people were following him and suffering the consequences of what this man's sin was, and Phineas put a stop to it. So he goes on to say, back to Exodus chapter six, these are the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, according to the armies. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are the same Moses and Aaron. So he's saying, isn't it amazing how years later, this Moses and Aaron who are being challenged by everybody, because again, they're reading this books of Exodus way after the fact. See how Moses was challenged by everybody and, and Phineas, his own grandson and you know Aaron's grand, was the only one who kind of stood up for God. These are that, these same people, who, this is that same Moses and Aaron, they're challenging God too. They're arguing with God. They're doing the very same thing that of what happened to them because they're more, they were more concerned about what the people said, but the people are gonna be mad. Pharaoh's gonna be mad. And so God, I'm not gonna do what you say, but look how they've changed. Now they stand up for God. Now they, they don't care what the people are saying. They care more about what God, but look where they started. And so that's hope for us. That's hope for us. Moses and Aaron started out going, oh, we're scared of what the people are gonna say. And they finally got to the point where we don't care what the people say. We only care what God says. And that is our whole, our whole progression. Hopefully that's where we get to. Where if God speaks to our heart and tells us to do something or to say something, we're not concerned with people's reactions. We're more concerned with obeying the word of God. God tells us to stand up and say, you know what, I, I follow Jesus. And rather than, if God, if God tells you to do that, I'm not saying just run into a supermarket and do that. We don't care what people will say. We only care that God has laid this on my heart to say, or God has laid this on my heart to do. And that is what's most important. Okay, so um, I'm going to end there. Thank you again for, for listening in. On Wednesdays, we are in the book of John. Um, and Jesus is in the last part of his ministry, the last nine months of his ministry, where he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's going to stay there, and he's going to challenge the Pharisees and try to warn them over and over of the judgment that's coming to them. Because they aren't listening to God. They're only listening to themselves. And so, and that's ultimately how the world is divided. Those who listen to God are those who listen to themselves. Okay, so thank you again. And uh, I will uh, talk to you. Hey Dottie and all the rest of you, thank you for listening in. We'll talk to you uh, next week. All right, bye-bye. Leave page. Oh, no, stay on page. I, okay, I'm going to figure this out in just a second. I'm lying. Here, in video. Found it. Okay.